Good morning, everyone. The welcome to our Sunday worship service. It's been cold. I hope uh, you've been keeping safe and warm. So after this service, please join for the Zoom coffee hour at 11 o'clock. And also, anybody who's interested in a spiritual journey, uh, please join me uh, on Thursday at 10 a.m. Okay, thank you. Please join me now in the call to worship. Sing praise to the Lord, O you faithful one, and give thanks to God's holy name. Hear, O Lord, and be gracious to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have clothed me with joy, so that my soul may praise you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will praise you forever. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come rejoicing with gladness of heart, singing your praises and adoring your wondrous gifts of love. You cause the darkness of night to steal away with the dawn. You bring us promise of new life in the gift of Jesus our Savior. We arise refreshed from the rest you give and wait for your Spirit to fill us with the hope of the Gospel. Come, create a Spirit, and dwell here among us. Hear our songs of thanksgiving as we seek to worship you in thought, word, and deed. Merciful God, hear our confession as we pray in Christ's name. We claim to be faithful, but we obey not your commandments. We boast of our hope, yet we dwell not in faith. We gather security about us, while others go hungry. We arm ourselves mightily, as though we could buy peace of mind. We hear Christ's words of assurance, but we live not in his promise. Forgive our ambivalence, 
as in Christ, we repent. We pray all these in Jesus' name, and we pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our help is in God. It is God who justifies. It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Know that as we confess our sin, God is just. Through Jesus Christ, who intercedes on our behalf, we have assurance that God forgives us. Amen. Let's have some old-time religion in an old-fashioned way. With some good old gospel singing, we'll be singing all the day. We'll have an old-time revival and we'll hear the old, old song. Give me that good old-time religion, give me that old-fashioned song. Give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion, give me that old-time religion, it's good enough for me. Precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul.
Keeping safe and warm. Okay, today is Transfiguration Sunday. A transfiguration means to change the way something or someone looks. So on this day, we remember how Jesus went up on a mountain top with his disciples and showed them just how special he was. Jesus had told his disciples, his close friends, that he would be killed and later rise from the dead. How do you think the disciples looked when Jesus told them that bad things were going to happen to him? They must have been very, very sad. Eight days after he had told them this, he chose three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to climb up a mountain with him. And Jesus took the disciples with him up that mountain to pray. But the disciples were very tired. The disciples prayed with him for a while, but pretty soon those tired disciples fell asleep. So while Jesus was praying, his faith and clothing began to glow like a light was shining inside him. His clothing turned white and glowed brightly. Two famous prophets, Moses and Elijah, men who had lived many, many years earlier, suddenly were right there talking to Jesus. The disciples woke up and saw the brightness and glory of Jesus, and they saw the two prophets talking with him. They were so surprised, they couldn't speak. So what do you think the disciples looked like when they saw Jesus glowing and these old prophets standing in front of them? I'm sure that this was a day that these disciples remembered for the rest of their lives. And Jesus was showing his disciples that he was truly special, that he was the Son of God. How do you think that made them feel about it? Jesus wanted to remind them that no matter what might happen, and no matter how sad they might feel or how bad things might seem, Jesus was very, very special. He was God's son. He would always be there to help them. This is what we remember and celebrate on Transfiguration Sunday. Let us pray. Jesus, thank you for always being nearby to love and help us. Remind us over and over again how very special you are and how very lucky we are. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture this morning is taken from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. 2 Kings, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. I read, When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, 
the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he replied, As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at Jordan. Elijah took his clock, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken away from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. Yet if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a shared of fire, horses of fire, appeared and separated the both of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the sheriffs and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. We continue our reading from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of his age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as our Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of God's glory displaced in the face of Christ. We continue our last reading from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 to 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain, where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the man, until the son of the man had risen from the land. This is the word of the Lord. It is Transfiguration Sunday on the liturgical calendar a time when Christians reflect on the visible revelation of Jesus Christ in his lifetime before his disciples, Peter, James, and John. Jesus bathed in glittering light, standing alongside Moses, the law-bearer, and Elijah, the prophet, as if he were a completion of the two kinds of God's revelation, the law and the prophets, 
all in one human divine package. Then clouds gather and a voice emerges. This is my son, the beloved. It is the Sunday that precedes Ash Wednesday and the descent into 40 days of Lent. A time of reflection, of penance, of awareness of our humanity, our mortality, our sinfulness, and our fellowship in this space with every other human on the planet. Every minute detail of this event is indeed full of profound significance. But today, I would like to point out an aspect of this feast which is often overlooked. The symbolic meaning of Mount Tabor, the mountain where the transfiguration occurred. Jesus went to the mountaintop not just to be transfigured himself, but to offer Peter, James, and John the space to be transfigured with him. The change that occurred that day was not in the Lord himself, who is eternally radiant with the divine glory in a way beyond our comprehension. The change was in the disciples, for Christ opened the eyes of their souls to behold his infinite holiness to the extent that they were able as human beings. If we observe this feast simply by celebrating the doctrinal teaching of Christ's divinity or the great mystical experience of the apostles, we will have excluded ourselves from the full meaning of this event. For as in all feasts of the church, the point is not simply to look back at what happened long ago. It is instead to enter into the eternal truth that is revealed. Jesus is a unique character in this story and in all stories. He is a character with whom we can identify in his humanity. He is a character who identifies with us in his divinity. In him we behold what we want to become. In us he lives as a presence that empowers us to become what God would have us become. As the Apostle Paul says, all of us with unveiled faces sing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.18 The promise of transfiguration is that the glory of God transforms our world and us from the inside out. The story of the transfiguration guides us on this path. Our spiritual transfiguration or transformation is like Mount Tabor. First, we must ascend the mountain of prayer. The disciples witnessed Jesus' transfiguration while in prayer. He ascended Mount Tabor to earnestly and wholeheartedly pray. Only as our Lord communed with his Father did his being transfigure. Thus, the first question we must ask ourselves if we truly desire transfiguration in our own lives, are we willing to pray? Are we willing to become people of prayer, authentic, consistent, disciplined prayer of the heart? 
Such deep prayer does not come easily, but is learned and experienced through practice and discipline, through guidance and faith. A second necessity on our path towards transfiguration is self-denial, sacrifice, and putting aside one's desire and will. We must make space in our own hearts and lives for God's presence. And this automatically implies denial of our egocentric ways. We all need to realize that the Christian life is not about me. It's not about you. It is not about what I want, what I desire, what makes me happy. At the center of the Lord's Prayer is the phrase, Your will be done. True happiness only comes through love, and divine love always means sacrificing for the other. The Christian paradox is that the more we sacrifice, the more we receive. The more we deny ourselves, the more we feel fulfilled. The more we die, the more we discover life. This is precisely why Jesus told his disciples before the transfiguration, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed. Christ himself followed that path of sacrifice and fulfillment of death and life. And then he called his disciples to walk the same path. If anyone desires to come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Just as we must sincerely ask ourselves about our life of prayer, we must also be ready to evaluate ourselves and see if we are living lives of self-denial, sacrifice, and divine love. So only through such practices can we reach our goal of transfiguration. The finally, a transfiguration occurs only when we are ready to offer back to the world what God freely gives us. When Jesus was transfigured, Peter wanted to bask in his glory and suggested that he make tents for all to stay on the mountain and permanently enjoy the moment. Christ, however, reminded his disciples that such ecstatic spiritual experiences were a foretaste of the victory that awaits us were momentary bursts of enlightenment and energy to empower us to go on in the spiritual struggle in this brief life. We are transfigured so that we can then carry the divine light of Christ to the world around us. Our Lord desires each one of us to be transfigured so that his light will then be carried forward to a dark world all around us. Transfiguration leads to service, ministry, and outreach. So why, why, why are we here in church every Sunday? What is the fruit of an authentic Christian life? What is our goal as Christians in this brief life here on planet Earth? The Feast of the Transfiguration reminds us that our goal should be nothing less than our own transfiguration. We may well ask ourselves, what are those little, little sacrifices that we have made since the Feast of Transfiguration a year ago? How far have we ascended up our own mount table? How have we changed 
over this time? What have we done to lead a better life since then? How have we improved? What have we given to God that we had not given Him before? It is this that we call pride progress. In what way am I a better Christian than a year ago? In our faith, we are called to struggle daily, whatever the rocks or boulders in our way. Whether they are pride or selfishness, lust or discouragement, envy or judging of others, we have to struggle to ascend our personal mount table. We have to fight for our personal transfiguration. That is why it is so important to come to confession and communion. If we do not do this, then the church will move away from us. For we can both go up and down a slope. We can spiritually progress, but we can also spiritually regress. We can be transfigured by the love of God, or we can be disfigured by the love of sin. And like regress is not sudden and dramatic, regress too, progress too, is a slope, as we say, a slippery slope. Let us therefore take heed and give God what He really wants from us, our hearts and minds spiritually progressing. Just before the beginning of Lent, every year the church goes mountain climbing. We go, like Peter and James and John did, following Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. God of all grace and goodness, throughout the ages, you have looked after the needs of your children. We thank you for your mercy. Bless the words we speak, that they may proclaim your greatness. Look with favor on those acts we perform, that we may show others your tender love. Make us responsive to the high calling of Jesus as we offer you gifts in his name. Amen. Thanks for joining our worship this morning and hope to see you next Sunday. I close our worship in prayer. Let us pray. Live with the ache that this world is not our home. Let it draw you to your Father. Hope in the promise that all will one day be made right. Let hope keep your eyes on Jesus. Recognize that God's reign has come and is coming. May the Spirit within you give you eyes to see God's reign at work around you. Live, hope, and see. In the name of the Triune God, go now from this place. Amen.